John and I have known each other since 1985 when I first heard his presentation. He said, wow, this is really going to help. <laughs> um, I, ha I have a theoretical question, and John and I have talked about this before, and I hear it all over the room with the questions that are coming to him. The concept of what happens in rows one through three are about the business. And the IT industry has hijacked enterprise architecture as a name, and nobody's really paying a lot of attention to rows one through three about what the business is supposed to do. And my question to everybody in the room is, how are we going to convince people that the information that we need to gather in rows one through three about what has to happen in the enterprise is just as important as the implementations in four, five, and six. Because when John first spoke uh, in the 80s, five years after he went around at the behest of IBM talking about this, he went back and asked people. Nobody was doing anything, hardly at all, in rows one and two because they didn't understand what was supposed to happen there. So what can we actually do to raise people's consciousness and change their perceptions so that we do the architecture first? Because four, five, and six is totally about the implementation. And from one set of business requirements in one through three, you can have a myriad of implementations for different things in four, five, and six. Yeah, you're, yeah this is really right. I tell, I, you know, here's what I've learned in the last five years, or maybe. Well, one thing is, the other dimension of my, my framework, the roles, which is Elizabeth been talking about, row one, two, one through six, okay. Uh, I didn't know this either until some, some guy uh, made the observation that it was in Houston a few years ago. But, but I would talk about, you know, row one is scope, you know, you to put the boundaries around things. You say, what is the limit we have to deal with here? And then the, row, row two is the semantic structure, the meaning, the concepts. And then row three is the logic, the design logic, as designed. Row four is as planned, that's the builder's view. Uh, the tooling config configuration is row five, and then the instantiation is row six. Okay, so uh, yeah, I used to talk about it as the owner, the designer, and the builder. Concept, logic, physics, you know, bounded by the, con the scope and the de scope kind of thing. And some guy said, well, that's reification. And I didn't, I never heard the word before. Okay, so it turns out the word reification comes out of philosophy. You know, Aristotle and Plato and those guys. They knew that an idea that you could have is one thing, but the instantiation of that idea is a completely different thing. Okay, so if you want the instantiation to bear any resemblance with what the idea is, it has to go through a well-known set of transformations. You have to identify it or name it so you can bound it. Then you have to define it. You have to have the semantic structure. Then you have to represent it. All the engineering design has done representations. Then you, then you specify it based upon your implementation technology. Then you configure it based upon the tooling, and then you instantiate it. Let's say it's reification. That's seven, it's got a couple thousand years old. I did not invent that. And it, I just happened, oh my gosh, I, when the guy tells me this is reification, uh, you know, it's, it's obvious. You got the owner, the designer, the builder. Okay, well, that's a semantic structure, the the logic and the and the physics, basically. You know, you got the the uh, the meaning, define it, then you have to uh, represent it for engineering design. They have to specify it based on the technology. It, well, it, it's a completely a complete correlation. And so, yeah, reification is the uh, is the other dimension. Okay, here's what I learned in the last few years. The laws of reification are incontrovertible. <laughs> you can say to me, well, that takes too long and it costs too much. It's a waterfall. OK, well, guess what? Then whatever you get in row six is not going to have anything to do with what row one or row two is. <laughs> you, you, you can argue, I don't want to do it for whatever reason. It takes too long and it costs too much, usually. The irony is it doesn't take very long, it doesn't cost very much if you, if you understand the ontological structure. It's quicker to do architecture than it is to do these big implementations. But that's my observation. So, but the, the laws are incontrovertible. 
If you do not define row one, two, and three, I don't care how well you do four, five, and six, you're gonna end up with an instantiation that does not map to what the row one, two, and three is. By the same token, if you do one, two, and three, and do not define four, five, and six, the same thing is gonna happen. You're gonna end up with an implementation that has nothing to do with what, the, what row one, two, and three is. So the laws of reification are incontrovertible. Uh, now, now, I never said you have to do all the whole, everything, enterprise. You can do it little by little, sliver by sliver. You know, you don't have to do everything. So, so it doesn't really take, take long. It, take, it, it takes somebody who understands the ontological structure to exploit that to help, you know, articulate, you know, what do we want to populate, what we don't want to populate. Now, would I tell the, C the CEO that? I, you know, if I have access to the CEO, you know, it, it depends upon the culture, basically. I may tell him this. On the other hand, I may just say, okay, chief, help me understand what the problem is. Let's talk about the problem until I understand that, then I populate my framework. I may not, not, not ever tell him that, okay? At some point in time, if the CEOs of the world understood what's going on here, they ought to use the ontological structure to not only plan the enterprise, but to operate it, and <laughs> to change it, for goodness sakes. You know, it, they, it ought to be their tool, not, 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 a, not our tool, not an IT tool. It ought to be their tool. It is, the, it is the classification of the total knowledge base, everything you could possibly know about the enterprise to, uh, to create it, to operate it, to change it, to, uh, to manage it. Yeah, yeah, but we we don't have that now. We don't. I was facetious the other day. I'm talking to you, some of you guys are there. Maybe you guys, they and I. I said I did some work with General Motors, and I, and I said, okay, how, who who which of you guys know how General Motors works? You know, who knows how General Motors? Works? So, well, the C, Rick Wagoner, the CEO, knows how General Motors works, right? Wrong. He doesn't know how it works. Okay, if he knew how it worked, he wouldn't be the ex CEO. Okay, so, no, he's, you know, there's a, he's got a problem. I'll tell you what, yeah. He's bankrupt, by the way. So what's the problem, Rick? If, if you have got an asset control problem, or do you have a process problem? Or is it a distribution issue? Or it's the allocation of responsibility? Or do you have a dynamics issue? Or is it a strategy problem? Or is it... A concept that's incorrect, or is it the logic, your, 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 the system logic, or is it the technology, or is it the tooling configuration? Where is the problem? Just, he has no way to look at it. And it's all, it's, 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 a, it's bankrupt. The thing is bankrupt. Okay, so you know, I could, I could, I mean, I knew a little bit about it. I could tell you what, tell you what my perception of the problem is, what, you know, just, but, but they never had to solve the problem because they got a massive infusion of capital from the external environment, you know, the taxpayers, okay? They were too big to fail, so they have poured money into things. Okay, so it's operating now. In fact, the stock price is going back up, and they, they say they're profitable. I, you know, they must be profitable. But did they solve the problem? I, I don't think they even know what the problem is. Okay, so we'll probably know if they solve the problem or not in 10 years or so if the thing goes under again. I'll tell you what, manufacturing smaller cars with different power plants is not going to fix that problem. They have to change the fundamental concept to mass customization. That's what they have to do. That's my opinion. Okay, so the, the problem is, you know, uh, Leonard was, uh, it was, our, you know, was eloquent about this. The customer doesn't know what they want until the moment in time they want it. See, so how are you going to deal with that? Well, you have to be able to dynamically c create the implementation that's required by, the, by whoever the customer is when they, when they demand it. That basically says you cannot anticipate the finished goods, the implementation that they want. You're going to have to have a p inventory of single variable components that you can dynamically assemble any, any number of implementations from. 
So, so you have to change the enterprise to mass customization. You have to be able to dynamically create whatever the requirement is. That's what, what they had to do with cars. They forget about manufacturing cars. They got to manufacture parts, but those parts have to be engineered to be assembled into more than one car. So you don't know what the, car, the customer's car is that they want until you get the order. The customer doesn't even know what they want until they get the order. And by the way, in, so, in some of the ma automobile manufacturing uh, uh, businesses, they do pretty clever mass customization. I was up at Scania here in Europe a few years ago now. Man, I was impressed with Scania. They man manufacture semis. You guys who are in, uh, in Europe would know that. The Amer Americans are, I think they, they, don't, they don't market in uh, Scania in, uh, in North America. Uh, they ma they market in Asia. They market in uh, UK here. I know, and in Europe. But I was impressed with. I, if I, I said if I could spend a month in your plant, I would learn a lot about enterprise architecture because they were doing they were doing mass customization effect. I, I was I was impressed. I don't know if I should. You 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 look at you know. I'll just give you an illustration. In every engine, you got a cylinder and a cylinder liner and a valve kind of assembly, or whatever. And if you look really carefully, that same component exists in any engine you order. You can order a straight 8, a V8, a straight 12, a V12, a diesel engine, a gasoline engine. They reuse the same components in any engine. Okay, now that's pretty clever. Now, now, now I, the first time they designed that, I'm sure it didn't work. This was a clever engineering feat. Okay, so hey, you know, they, they if you look down a row of those trucks, they all lo look different, but if you look carefully, the windshields are all the same. Okay, so, so they're manufacturing parts that can be assembled into more than one finished good. Okay, that, that, the idea is mass up. That came from the Japanese, actually. The Japanese thought the Western manufactured a lot of hard lessons the last 35 or 40 years. You know? So, you know, so, so that, they changed the concept to a mass customization. Uh, so that's probably what the problem was. Uh, you know, the question is, e even if you can figure, even, okay, Rick, uh, even if you wake up some morning and say, oh, I, geez, I see what's happening. I see why these guys can produce custom automobiles at higher quality and lower cost than we can produce standard automobiles off the shelf. Oh, they are manufacturing, managing parts, not finished goods. So the question now becomes, how long will it take you to change the enterprise from a standard production environment to mass customization? Not a day, not a week, not a year. You want to stay in business? That's what you're going to do. You better figure out a way to, you know, to, that, to begin to imp impose that cultural change. Boy, we we're talking about that too. Because not only do you change the manufacturing concept and the process, you have to change the culture as well. Just, just hang on. So, I'd, I'd like to sort of draw this through because I, I got a lot of resistance from from various people coming into the room that the Zachman framework can't do waterfall. It's not kept up to date. It can't do this whole sort of sprint, lean stuff. And the few questions we've had, it, it, it's very interesting. You know, I wonder what all this lean manufacturing, to use your term, is really all about. I think there's a big question the IT industry needs to ask itself in terms of, is this just a work creation scheme? Because we're not actually engineering this stuff. We're not architecting it the way you're saying. And I think... For me, that's the big insight I've got out of this. We're going to have time for a few more. Sorry to come back to the Agile thing, but um, you described how you sat down with your architect friend and assimilated the way that they do. They do the design, they, they do the blueprints, etc., for what the customer wants and what the builders should do. But where I'm struggling with, and I think you might have hit the nail on the head by saying doing it in small pieces, but where I'm struggling with is I know I hear about all these agile methodologies that say start coding and we'll figure it out on the way, essentially, in, in, in small scrums and we'll do the design of one piece and then test it with the user and then go to the next piece. And to me that sounds a bit like I'm start building the house before I actually know what it looks like in its totality. 
And that's why I would like to see how would the framework help me and you know, what are your thoughts around how we perceive architecture, whether it's, you know, especially if we bring it from other, not from other uh, disciplines like proper building architecture or engineering with what we see these days happening in, in software engineering, which is start building and we'll figure it out as we go along. Uh, you know, there's no silver bullet, okay? And the world, we were just having a conversation about that too. The world is, it has a penchant for silver bullets. We want to throw money at the problem and, you know, and the pain goes away. It's not going to happen. Actual work is going to have to take place. Somebody's going to have to do some work. And, the, and I, my, my proposal is the work that we have to learn how to do is engineering work. We're pretty good at manufacturing, actually. We're good at building and running systems. We're really good. The alchemists were good at building compounds, basically, by trial and error. We, and best practice, in fact, we use those words. We use the best practice, our, our methodolo methodologies. Why, theoretically, does the methodology work? And well, you know, what, how, how does it work? Why does it work the way it works? Well, it works because I do, I do it that way. Now, I've been doing it for 25 years, so, you know, I know it works. Okay, well, why does it work? Well, that's not, a, you know, just do what I told you to do and everything will be, ha you'll be happy. So it's all by practice or best, best practice and trial and error and, and people get really good at it. I mean, I, there's a lot of people really good at doing implementation, manufacturing work. We're not doing engineering work. See, that's, that's the point that, that learn, the, the takeaway, say. Well, actually, it's a different kind of work. Okay, so, so you have to do the engineering work because you have to engineer the parts so they can be assembled into more than one, ob more than one finished good. Okay, how do you do that? Well, you have to know the total set of finished goods at any one point in time. And then you can engineer things to be assembled into that set at that point in time. That's why the limit is really important to identify. Okay, so what is the limit we have to work with? Okay, now, once you, once you set the limit and you start to do the, the engineering work, I, I, I typically I'll do this. I say, you know, in the bill of materials, it, it is describing the parts and part structures. There is no expression of functionality in a bill of materials. There's no fix, uh, 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 reflection of geometry in the bill of materials. There's no, uh, no identification of responsibility in the bill of materials. There's no time in the bill of materials. There's no design objective in the bill of materials. It's parts and parts structures. That's all. In the functional specs. There's no parts or part structures in the functional, functional specs. There's no geometry in the functional specs. There's no uh, operating responsibility in the functional specs. There's no time, there's no uh, design objective in the functional specs. There's functional specs. Okay, now, this is the way they engineer airplanes and buildings and locomotives and battleships and supercomputers. And you know, you look at one thing, that one, looking at that one thing doesn't implement it. You're just describing that thing in the context of its uh, in, in its context, I, I, that's circular logic, but you, you're only looking at one thing at a time to do the engineering because you want to normalize that, okay? Now, the implementation has to be, by definition, a composite. They have to have at least two variables. So they have to have the inventory and the, and, and the functionality. They have to have the inventory and the functionality and the geometry. You know, now, now, you, now you, put, you have a composite. You can do an implementation, inventory, pro, function, and operating instructions, okay? You understand, so the composite, the implementation of the composite of more than one variable. But you engineer it, single variable at a time. Okay, so that's what we, the, we, the IT community in general, for the last 75 years, that's hard for us to understand because it doesn't run if you only have one, one variable. You have to have the data element, and the instruction, add, subtract, multiply, and divide, by the way, and, and you have to have the address of the data element and the instruction, and you have to have the work product format, the screen format to populate, and then you have to have any control structures, and then you have to have constraints or any rules, you know, and you embed that in one object, and that's implemented. Okay, but you've got multiple variables in one object. If you want to change any one of those variables, you want to change the data, you scrap the whole thing and start over again. You want to change the function, scrap the whole thing and start over again. So fundamentally, we, th we think in terms of composite constructs. Okay, so that's what's, that's, what's, that's what's hanging us up because we're manufacturing people. 
You know, and we and we're good at it, actually. You know, and you know, there's a lot of. I, I'm not saying it's a bad idea at all. In fact, if, if we hadn't been doing what we've been doing for the last 75 years or so, there wouldn't be an enterprise in existence today. Okay, so nobody ought to be complaining. But the fact of the matter is, what we have is a lot of legacy implementations that are not architected. They're not integrated. They're not flexible. They're not interoperable. They're not reusable. They're not aligned. But they're implemented. Don't forget that. Okay, so there's something good about that. But I'm just saying, in the you start looking in the future, now we have to do the engineering work. Okay, well now we have to you know, not only do the manufacturing, we do the engineering work. And begin to get the signal variables, we get the bill of materials, we get the functional specs, we got the geometry, and we can engineer each one of those things you know, and normalize them and so on. Then we reuse those primitive components to create any composite do we want to create? My name is Peter McElwain John. I'm the CTO of Aldermore Bank. And for, for several years now, I've been chairing design authorities in whichever organizations I've been working for. And a, a few years ago, I, I stumbled on a useful technique. So when, whenever an item comes before me now, I you know, welcome and introduce the, the presenters. And then I, I, I turn to them and I say, please could you explain to me the business problem you're trying to solve and the way in which you propose to solve it? It's a very effective technique. It's amazing how quickly you can find out if a project is well formed or not with that, that simple question. So there's a practical tip um, that you may or may not want to follow. Now, the question I wanted to ask was this. Uh, so, so John, uh, uh, you, uh, as you very modestly described it, 30 years ago you stumbled across um, some, some useful looking um, uh, techniques and, 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 and your framework. Um, and fast forward now to today, we're, we're all of us working in a field where there's no accepted definition of what enterprise architecture is. There's no accepted definition of what an ex enterprise architecture is. Um, we still suffer from uh, exponentially increasing complexity, uh, diminishing alignment, and all the rest of it, everything you've been talking about. What do we need to do to turn enterprise architecture from alchemy into chemistry. What, what are we missing? My observation is going to be, you better, we, we better, oh, wait a minute, before I say this so I don't aggravate everybody. But in architecture and construction or in engineering and manufacturing or in anybody who creates complex objects, whatever they happen to be, they are not arguing about what architecture is. They know what architecture is. Do we want to build a bill of materials or not? We want to build it. Do you want to build the functional specs or not? We're going to build it. Do you want to build it, define the geometry or not? We're going to d define it. They, they, can they can make judgments or choices and say, well, we're not going to define the geometry. We're willing to make assumptions about that or let anybody make assumptions. You can make choices, but they're making trade-off choices, okay? But fundamentally, there's a set of des descriptive representations for every object whether it's a table or a glass or an automobile or a computer or a Boeing 747 or XYZ, okay? And those, those, those descriptive representations, representations are well-defined and nobody is arguing about it. They may argue how you want to do it. They got, you know, there's a lot of variables here still, but the but basic descriptive representations are fair, very well-defined. That's what we do not have. We do not agree what architecture is. Okay, so until we agree what architecture is, the probability is we're not going to solve this problem. Now, I, I'm going to submit to you, my framework is architecture. Because it's architecture for every other known object that is known to humankind. It is just, it is, I just put enterprise names on the same descriptive representation for describing anything. Airplanes, buildings, or computers, or what. So my, I think I happen to stumble across the ontological structure, the, de the, ar the definition of architecture. Now, you, can, you may or may not like my framework. Actually, I don't really care whether you like it or not. It happens to be architecture, but it's architecture for every other thing. But until we come to an agreement and say, OK, the Zachman framework turns out to be enterprise architecture. Let's start from there, and then we can use that as a basis for defining any methodology we want to define. And there are n different kinds of methodologies. There, there, there's not one methodology, there's n methodologies. 
because every methodology is defined to create a different compo composite. Okay, so how many, how many compounds are there? It's infinite. Okay, so it'll go infinite. So, but there's one ontology. There's one periodic table. There's n different chemical processes. So I, I think that's where it goes. So, boy, I, you know, I, I normally, I wouldn't probably have said that in, in public because it really sounds self-serving, but I'm pretty careful to say I did not invent this. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I think I, uh, the Zachman framework, oh, let's call it the enterprise ontology, so it doesn't, it isn't mine. I, somebody asked me today, about uh, the, the the tooling, the vendors. Did they, did they you know, did they acquire my want, want to acquire my framework? I would never sell my framework to anybody. There were tooling vendors who wanted to give me money, a lot of money, and I would declare they that they are the Zachman framework, uh, the, the exclusive Zachman framework tool, or the exclusive enterprise architecture tool. I would never do it. Because I do not believe anybody owns the periodic table, including Mendeleev. Okay, Thanks. that is wrong. It's basically a reflection of the laws of nature. And I don't own the Zachman framework, and nobody owns it. That else owns it. Okay, so you don't, there's a lot of tool vendors here. I, thought, I know a lot of the tool vendors, okay. And I would say, if they, if they show me something, I will, tell you, I will tell them whether they support my framework or not. I mean, I, you know, it's, a, it's an objective it's certification. I can certify it. I tell what the criteria It's on my website, I'll put the criteria for certification. I will say that, but I will never sell it to them, let them own it. Because it's wrong. It's, it, I, nobody owns the laws of motion. Nobody owns Boyle's Law or Faraday, or nobody owns any of that stuff. That's... That is laws of nature. That's the way I, that's the way I see it. And, and I think you, we can argue. You guys may or may not like my framework. I, you may or may not like what I said tonight. I, I, I don't know, but I, I, I think, think it, we're on the right track. John, I think we all really enjoyed tonight. So I'd just like okay. to thank you very much. Hey. hey, thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Holy smokes. <laughs> Jeez. Thank you very much for coming. Great. Okay, thank Lauren, thank you.